And now, the best shotgun guy in anybody's sleigh, Edward St. Pay. It's Nightjeet. Well, Merry Christmas and thank you, Santa Claus. Happy holidays to everyone out there. This is Nitek, and it's emanating from the Mississippi East Center in downtown Jackson, Mississippi. And we're happy to be with you tonight across the state, and uh, thanks for being with us. Well, you know, there's always a lot of news coming out of California. It's one of the places that news just emanates out of. And from the West Coast, we've got some very important news for you this evening. The LAX Airport Commission has approved building a separate terminal for the rich and famous. It's actually true. It's a safety measure that's being equipped with technology that doesn't mistake silicone and Botox for plastic explosives. <laughs> well, California Governor Jerry Brown assured Californians that Syrian refugees will be extensively vetted before they are allowed into the state. U.S. immigration authorities say so far 250 Syrian refugees have made it into Los Angeles, but they're having a lot of difficulty assimilating. None of them speak Spanish. <laughs> California's Wildlife Service published survival tips for when you're threatened by attack while you're camping this winter. It's all common sense. If attacked by bears, play dead. If you're attacked by terrorists, don't play dead. And if you're attacked by hippies, play the grateful dead and give, give them weed. <laughs> well, in news from the AARP, a new dating service called Stitch is being called Tinder for Seniors. It's catering to the mature adults looking for companionship. Or in other words, it's the digital equivalent of bingo night. Well, a photo posted on Facebook of a Pennsylvania nun posing next to a deer she just shot on the first day of hunting season went viral with 1.5 million views. And it was the first time she ever even shot a gun. Up to now, she was wrapping their hooves with a ruler. <laughs> well, if you've uh, joined us at any time over the last few months, you've probably seen Mr. Johnny Riley. He's uh, got a, a brand of the blues called Outlaw Blues. It's sort of a Texas blues mix. It's a really uh, great music. And Johnny Riley is here with us uh, for this evening for a performance. Uh, he's recently been nominated for a big award. We'll talk a little bit about that in the show. And also the documentarian Peter Von Puttkammer. He's made documentaries for the Geograph National Geographic Channel, Discovery Network, a whole lot of major networks have used his documentaries. He's here from Canada tonight to talk about his latest production. So stay with us for Nighty. We'll be right back with more of Nighty after these messages. Ingalls Shipbuilding has pioneered the development and production of technologically advanced, highly capable warships for the U.S. Navy, Coast Guard, and Marine Corps for more than 75 years. Ingalls is Mississippi's largest manufacturing employer. And today, Ingalls has an immediate need for more than 200 electricians at our Pascagoula, Mississippi site. Apply today at www.buildyourcareer.com or call 888-935-1507. And now back to more Night Chief. Okay, now uh, during the break we were talking about uh, your recent travel, uh, which uh, your travels took you to the crossroads. The real crossroads. The real crossroads. Okay, first l let's explain if anyone out there wants to know about the crossroads and the significance of that with the blues, tell us that story and then tell us about your trip there. Okay, well. They have a crossroads in Clarksdale, Mississippi, and it's up 61 and 49, and they put it up. But if a lot of the blues guys will tell you that's not the real one, that's for tourists or whatever. And what happened originally at the crossroads? Well, originally, uh, the, the legends has it that, that that Sun House had told Robert Johnson, and Robert Johnson would follow Sun House and this other guy around and want to play, and Robert really couldn't play that well. But then all of a sudden, Robert went missing, and when he came back, he, boy, he could play really great. He was like a pro. And Sun House looked at him and said, boy, you must have sold yourself to the devil to play like that. And so there it went that he supposedly went down to the crossroads because that's an old Delta legend. And it comes from Africa that you go down and talk to Legba. Well, Legba was like a, a loa or a spirit in voodoo that opened up the ways and would move obstacles for you. And then it went from that 
uh, like a spirit or an angel doing it to the said, well, it was now the devil that did it. So it kind of evolved over the years. And so he sold his soul to the devil. Yeah, that, supposedly essence. he sold his soul to the devil and, and then he could play guitar and, and he died at a young age. Because, uh, uh, you know, that's what I, when, when uh, I, I wrote a song called Have Mercy on Me and I use a line in there that says, you got to pay the piper if you're going to play the blues. And then Crossroads of My Life, I got influenced uh, to write that, the words uh, to that, uh, because I'd studied some of that stuff by the Crossroads. But Carol and them took me out to a place and, and we went out there and they were shooting pictures and it's out by Dockery Farms. It was like straight across and there's this long road and we passed this old graveyard and we got out there and me and Tommy Davis, my first cousin, was out there and we had our instruments and we're sitting there playing because if you're a musician, it was like, don't play your guitar. Then you need to take it from me because if it's in my hand, I'm going to play it. So we're playing and uh, he said, you better watch it. You'll call him up. I'm like, who? And I wasn't even thinking. And he goes, you know who? I said, whatever. He goes, hold on. See, uh, uh, he said, I got to take a break for a minute. And so he, he went over to the weeds and came back. And, and we were sitting there, and I remembered uh, folklore said, well, you always got to leave something. If you come, you got to leave something like candy or money or something like that. So they always said, use the power of three, three pieces of candy or three pennies or whatever. So I pulled three pennies out of my pocket and I flipped them up. Well, the wind was kind of blowing a little bit, but it was sun shining. And where we were standing, it got really, really cold. And I said, he looked at me, did you feel that? And I said, dude, that's weird. But the pennies, when they came down, they landed on heads at my feet. Well, it freaked me out. I left the pennies there and we got through and we left. And what was so cool about it, I came back and told Mickey Rogers. Now, Mickey Rogers is a legend and Mickey plays on this album, Crossroads of My Life. And Mickey uh, come up under Howlin' Wolf and Hubert Sumlin. In fact, he, they taught Mickey how to play, uh, Hubert taught Mickey how to play the guitar. I said, Mickey, I got to tell you something. He said, what? I said, man, we went out to Crossroads out there. He said, can I take you out there? I said, yeah. I said, we was out there. I said, but man, I threw three pennies and they landed on heads. He said, you got your luck. And Mickey's an old guy. So what do you mean I got my luck? He said, if you go back out there, they'll be on tails. I'm like, holy moly. So I got some friends that said they studied that stuff that, that, that uh, they go, you got to watch that Crossroads Magic Man. And, uh, but I said, I don't know. I said, it, it, it's, it was real for me when I went. I said, I didn't feel, I said, it, but it was odd. Strangely odd. So I think there's there's something about that delta. There's things there that people just can't put their finger on. But it's a magical place. Now, uh, you were in the U.S. service. Yes, I was in the Army. Okay, so when you were uh, serving the country back in those days, did you were you uh, aware that you were going to become an entertainer? Or was that what your I original it, plan? I was? knew it from the day I was was old enough to walk now, and talk. Isn't that the truth, though? I mean. Don't you think there's something that happens? We are innately aware of what it is we're supposed to do. My father said that I took a Sears and Roebuck catalog and they had an old, a old red Fender guitar in there. And when I was two years old, I'd lay in my crib and sit there and play it. And I thought, I don't know if they know former lives or whatever, but I knew I was going to play guitar and sing from the time, because I started when I was little. I loved music. You remember from the time you can remember? From the time I remember, I always wanted to play. I always wanted to sing. I used to, I wanted to act. I wanted to do these things, entertain. My mom said I used to, I wanted to be Flip Wilson. You remember Flip? Yeah. The comedian. I would put on shows for Geraldine. my grandma. Geraldine. Yeah, Geraldine. You watch it, honey. You know, when he's do that and all that <laughs> stuff. And Geraldine. And, and I watched all that. And I wanted to do shows for my family. And I'd come out and would, you know, I'd do something. I'd go, ta-da. But from the time. And so I've always been. I didn't say, well, I didn't make it in law school. I guess I'll, you know, be an mm -hmm. actor. No, I have always acted, played music, sang, wrote songs, poetry, any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, and other people I've talked to, and I feel the same way. I mean, you kind of know uh, if you... You either, it's either in you or it ain't in you. You right. either have it or you don't have yeah, it. Yeah, you really. I mean, you, it's, it's true. I wonder if that's fate. Is that is that fate? I mean, is it I predestined? Just, is I, it predestined, you think? That I, think gonna, just, I think it's just, if, people, if you believe in God, and I do, I, I believe God just puts you... I, I think he gives certain people certain talents and certain people, you know... And uh, I was raised, at, oh, you can't play any music but gospel music, because my father was a holiness preacher. Now, what exactly is a holiness preacher? Holiness preacher, uh, Word of Faith, Pentecostal, they shout, sing, dance, hoop, holler, and uh, preach hard. Hell so hot, you could feel the heat. You know, I mean, like, we'd go to tent meetings, and uh, I remember I was in a tent meeting watching R.W. Shambach. That was back when they had tent meetings, and people would go under these big, huge tents, and they'd have the preacher and the, and the choir and all this, and... So I was raised in all that, but I was raised that man. If you you don't want to sell your you'll sell your talent, man. You God gave you a talent, and I got to thinking, well, what if I was a plumber? 
Can I only work on Christian people's houses on their toilets? What if they hire me to go work in a nightclub to fix their plumbing? Can I do that? And no one could answer me. And right before my father passed, which he passed uh, in 2014 last year, he said, you go play your music and do what you do. Just remember where you come from. So it kind of blessed me. He said, that was yeah. a blessing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And he goes, if you ever need the power of God, it'll be with you. Remember you know what? That. I got a similar story. Uh, my daddy died over 20 years ago. But when I was growing up, I played music, too. I played rock and roll. And, of course, my dad didn't, he didn't really understand. He didn't like it. Uh, <laughs> he didn't get it. He didn't get it. And then, all of a sudden, I was in television, and I was trying to uh, be involved in television as a young adult. And he, but finally, when he saw me on the air before he died, he, he, he saw me doing weather, and he said, did I understand? Now, now, now I get it. Now he understood. And then it wasn't long after that that he died. You know, it's, it's a blessing. Right, way, and if know? I don't listen to the haters, what they call the kids call haters day, but the negative people, I wouldn't be where I'm at. Yeah. You know, go out and do this, get a regular job, do this. I, and I, I worked for years. I was in law enforcement, and I was on four days and all four days. And the four days I was off, I was playing and singing and dancing, anything I could do. It's hard. Everything's hard, but it, it, it's even harder if you give up because then that's a Well, I tell sure them cream always to, rises to the top. Yeah, if, I mean, you, if you keep practicing, you keep doing, somebody's going to notice you. Right. You, can, you, you can't succeed if you give up along the way. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to keep going in anything, but, but giving up's worse. You know. Well, that's why I was, I've been always different all my life, I mean, strange or whatever you want to call it, but I just, I'm going to be me. I mean, <clears> you only go around once that I know of, so, you know, I love playing and singing music, and I sing blues music, rock music, uh, country. Uh, I love, I love it all, you know. Uh, I even like old Irish songs, and uh, I'm a Shane McGowan fan, you know, and the Pogues and all those guys. Okay, we're going to come back with some uh, performances uh, and um, a little more discussion with the, uh, yeah. with the remaining few minutes of the show, okay? Okay, great. All man. right, back in a minute. This is our Gray's Box. It's a great way to snack. Fresh, tasty, and created using only the best ingredients. Choose from our range of over 90 delicious snacks. We'd like to invite you to try a hand-picked box for free. Go to grays.com and we'll send a free box directly to your office or home. It may even help you keep your hand out of the cookie jar. Go to grays.com and enter the code grays34 for a free box. Grays.com. Snacking. Reinvented. I lose my sense of 
the blues. We'll be right back with more of Nighty after these messages. Ingalls Shipbuilding has pioneered the development and production of technologically advanced, highly capable warships for the U.S. Navy, Coast Guard, and Marine Corps for more than 75 years. Ingalls is Mississippi's largest manufacturing employer, and today Ingalls has an immediate need for more than 200 electricians at our Pascagoula, Mississippi site. Apply today at www.buildyourcareer.com or call 888-935-1507. And now back to more Night Cheek. Well, we'd like to welcome Peter von Putkammer Hi, to our studio. Welcome. Now, yeah. uh, you are a director and producer, yes. and uh, you are presently working on a project called Killian Bigfoot, That's which right. is filming around the southeast right now. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's that pro project all about? Well, uh, I've been interested in Bigfoot for a long time. I first started with working with native peoples in North America and there's a lot of stories about wild man of the woods, wild woman of the woods and I'd actually see these costumed figures at ceremonies uh, like fire lit ceremonies and things like that and I thought you know someone ought to do a great show on Bigfoot. We did their first one in 1998 called Sasquatch Odyssey and it's sort of a bit of a cult classic now and one that was shortlisted for the Oscars and uh, we were in the IDA festivals and that led us to another series called Monster Hunters. So we did some of the earliest cryptozoology and cable television uh, that was on Discovery Channel, Monster Hunters in 2000, 2001. And then uh, come around this time, uh, starting uh, in the last five years, we started pitching an idea of this group of hunters that actually want to kill a Bigfoot to prove it's real. And we finally got interest when there was more interest on guys from the South. And uh, they said, okay, uh, Rednecks killing Bigfoot, we like that. And these guys like to call themselves rednecks, oh, not yeah. just me. Right. Uh, so they're, you know, it, it was really interesting. What interests me about it is these guys are smart guys. Uh, you know, they're engineers and geologists and, you know, ex-cops and army and uh, they, you know, they're career guys, professionals. Uh, they're true woodsmen, you know, and that they've, they're not trophy hunters, they're people that you know, like to go out and they hunt, they eat what they shoot, uh, and they respect the forest, and um, they're not bloodthirsty killers, but in this case, they feel the DNA won't do it. Uh, you gotta have a body. Photographic evidence won't do it anymore because of Photoshop, mm -hmm. so. So now you've been a, a director and a producer for 30 years, right? Yeah. Tell us about some of the projects you've worked on through the years. Right. Well, um, I've worked, at my early part of my career, I worked a lot with Native Americans. I got into it. I did a film degree at the University of British Columbia, and I almost got immediately into a job working in the summers with uh, First Nations, as they're called in Canada, or Native Americans. And uh, I, I'd grown up around Indian people, Native people, and so I was always fascinated in it. <clears throat> and so some of my earliest Film projects were social and you know health films and cultural films, working with Native people, and I've actually won the American Indian Film Festival three times and uh, been sh screened there a lot of times. And then we did a show called Spirit of the Mask, with uh, Wade Davis, who's quite a well-known author. He wrote Serpent in the Rainbow on how zombies are made in Haiti, and his it was made into a Wes Craven movie, uh, Universal Pictures with Bill Pullman. Uh, so Wade's a well-known uh, anthropologist, and I've worked with him three times. So I've always been interested in um, anthropology, indigenous peoples, mythology, um, things that tell us a lot about the world that we're in that might, people might think are fantasy, but are right here, right now. And I, I like presenting the world in different ways. And a lot of, a lot of the mythologies <coughs> sort of uh, cross-pollinate into various cultures, don't they? I mean, you get the replicating story, like Joseph Campbell talked about that, yeah. you know, with the hero with a thousand faces, how these characters pop up in, you know, in cross-cultural ways, you know, but it's a similar character, you know. Yeah, Interesting, I, loved, I love Joseph Campbell. I mean, Spirit of the Mask, um, which is really about um, the importance of masks in different cultures, but it was also about the loss of 
the way masks connected human beings to nature and to a spirit world. Mm -hmm. And the masks of the Pacific Northwest do that more than like totals. Any, anything. Yeah, I mean, these masks are family heirlooms. They, they're passed from generation to gen generation, and they, they go back to original creation myths and original, uh, it's where the family got the rights to perform certain masks, uh, certain songs and dances, and have the right to use that mask, including Bokwus, Wild Man of the Woods, or Zunaqua, Wild Woman of the Woods. And you had to have a, you know, it was a, it was an aristocracy, really. There were kings and queens on the Pacific Northwest. And um, so they redistributed wealth at these ceremonies uh, to people so they would come and see who they were, what their background were, and the supernatural beings of the forest that they were connected to. And um, so Joseph Campbell, you know, was a big inspiration for that. And, and then we did Sasquatch Odyssey um, and in 1998, and that that used Joseph. I used the hero's journey within that because it was about the four horsemen of Sasquatchery, the original. Uh, that's how they're referred to. Um, so Peter Byrne, John Green, Renee De Hinden, Dr. Grover Krantz, and they really started the field of Bigfoot research. And Peter Byrne was a uh, writer. Uh, he became a writer. He was a big game hunter. Uh, turned conservationist, but he was hired by a Texas oil man to hunt uh, the Yeti in 1956, and um, it's quite a story. So Tom Slick, uh, monster hunter, was f funding all these expeditions all over the world to find some of these creatures, and p eventually all three of these men, one from Switzerland, one from British Columbia, one from England, Ireland, via India. They all ended up working together on a 1960 Pacific Northwest Bigfoot expedition. And it's the story of their lives and how, you know, they argue and bicker about, is it ape, is it human? Some of the same things that we're dealing with in killing Bigfoot. And if it is human, is it murder to kill one? And if it's, if, if it's an ape, is that just a, a misdemeanor? like? Someone shoots a dog or something like that. So it continues to, to raise a lot of hackles to this day. And we, we touched on it in Sasquatch Odyssey and, and now in Killing Bigfoot more than ever, people get very irate at the notion of killing a Bigfoot. It gets pretty heated in the debate, right? Yeah. Because it's sort of, it seems like it's, a, you know, whatever this is, it's sort of a missing link between, you know, where we are as humans today yeah. and where we maybe came from. Maybe that's a, that's the missing link. Or, uh, so uh, there's got to be yeah. some humanity in there. I mean, the, somewhere. You know, the hunters. You know, um, I mean, all of their uh, evidence supports the ape mm -hmm. theory. Mm -hmm. You know, so far. Um, I mean, we just found uh, what in Africa, South Africa, just found a two and a half million year old skeleton. Right. That's um, quite human. Right. Not ape like. Quite human. I saw the the, yeah. uh, the the recreation of what it could have looked like. It was, I think, in National Geographic, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it was a humanoid. Yeah, it was like a missing link. Yeah, I guess you could say. Um, and so, it, in the uh, the uh, the indigenous peoples' mythology, there is a Sasquatch that that pops up. I mean, there have been sightings and recollections of this type of creature even through those yeah. uh, times. Well, what's interesting is that. To this day, <laughs> the people, the, the, the no-kill people, um, a lot of them refer to Native Americans and talk about how they always had a gentle relationship with the Bigfoot, but that's, it's not really true. Um, in some cases, they are revered as kind of, you know, a good luck symbol and, you know, um, um, it, it's, it's helpful when you see one and, and help, help your lives and that sort of thing, but we were just in southeast Texas where, you know, they have the Alabama Cushada tribe and they talk about a cannibal, a wild man, a cannibal wild man that lives in the big thicket. And it's, that goes back centuries. Um, certainly aspects of Buck Woos from the Pacific Northwest, Zunikwa steals children. There's a lot of stories about Bigfoot taking children, taking women over the years from tribes, from, you know, pioneers. Um, pioneer tales going back really? about that. Really? So the question is, do the tales about them taking kids and that, was that just a, 
Hansel and Gretel story to keep kids out of the woods, right? right? With this Zunikwa, uh, who really is a witch who would put pine pitch in kids' eyes so they would be blinded. She has a basket and all the depictions. She throws the kids in the basket. She takes them off to, to eat them in the forest. And um, so is that real? I mean, is that, is that based on things that happen to kids and to, you know, that some creature would come out and do that? Or is it just a, you know, some uh, lesson for a kids? Lesson. You know? So uh, Killing Bigfoot is on Discovery Destination America. That's right. And you're, you've got another show that's uh, running yeah, on the network right on, now. Yeah, it's on, yeah, Biggest and Baddest is a adventure wildlife series. Um, I, a lot of the crew that are with me uh, uh, on this Killing Bigfoot are filming on that. It stars a guy named Niall McCann, and he's a young biologist, and we look at large, formidable animals all over the world. Some of the, you know, ideas that aren't true, misconceptions people have about them, um, so everything from mountain gorillas and lions and anacondas. And then we look at sort of things that they're facing today, human conflict, deforestation. Um, it's, it's got a conservation message, but it's really an entertaining adventure wildlife show. And it's, it's a lot of fun to watch and uh, great cinematography. And, uh, and that show different. is on what network? It's running right now on National Geographic Wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we want to thank you for coming on the program. It's been an honor to meet you, and good luck with all of the future things that you're working on. Good. Okay. Thanks, Ed. Peter, thank you for being with thank us. Thank you. That's Peter from Killing Bigfoot. He's the director producer of that program. Peter von Putkam. Okay, good. Join us every weeknight statewide for Night Teak with Edward St. Pay. If you have suggestions for guests or want to be on the show yourself, drop us a line at www.nightteak.com. I'm your announcer, Jim Pollard. Good night from all of us at Night Teak.